Welcome back, fam. Today is a special episode of Ghostly Storytime because you have been so patient with me. I know I keep telling you that I've been editing this Ghostly Storytime, but I totally scrapped it and started over and you've been nothing but patient. So we're gonna talk about some ghost stories anyway. Well, I'm almost done. I swear I'm almost done. I'm at the halfway point. So let's go to good old Reddit and see if we can find some scary shit. about to kill this bastard. How about I plug you in? Shit. Oh, yeah, fuck you too. I'll get it. My problem with like no sleep and stuff is I got into it thinking like it could be the game of what's true and what's fiction. And I just, I don't know. I used to listen to it while tidying up the store after we closed, right? And I just hit a point where I was like, you're not scaring me. You're just, you're, you're not scaring me. I want more. So, I don't know, clearly I missed the Mike Thorns. So, we'll see how this goes. I don't know. I'm kind of annoyed that it's in light mode. I was camping with my husband and his family at a small remote lake in New Mexico. There were about 10 people in our group and another group of six people in the next campsite. It was nighttime and both groups were doing typical activities making s'mores, having a few drink and telling stories. When we all heard what sounded like a little girl yelling out for help. Neither group had children with them, but we were all positive we were hearing a little girl and decided to search the area we heard the noises from together. There was a field behind our campsites and we all saw a very tall, pure white figure standing maybe a hundred feet away from us in the field making noises we all agreed this thing looked maybe six feet tall skinny and white as can be we made our way closer to investigate but whatever it was that we saw started backing off as we got closer and it disappeared into the trees at night we continued to hear a little girl calling for help as we tried to sleep. Fuck that. I saw Blair Witch. I'd be like, I am out. I am out. I will do it for all eternity. I don't give a shit. I am out. My mother attracted evil. After my parents divorced when I was a teenager, I lived with my mother. I experienced lots of paranormal happenings. Several times when I was reading in my bed, the room would start to feel really icy. Next, it would feel as if something, somebody that hated me was staring at me. And when I got that feeling, I would leave the room and come back an hour later. Sometimes during the day, I would see a shadow figure sneaking along my bedroom walls. Fuck that. Something in the flat was pretending to be my dog. I went into my room and heard a deep growl from under the bed. My dog wasn't capable of making a noise that deep. It sounded like either a really big dog or a man doing his best dog impersonation. Other times, my dog would whimper and pace in the room next to mine, but wouldn't come when called, as if he was afraid of something in the hallway. When I moved in with my father, the paranormal activity stopped. This story kind of sounds like my own experience uh, that I had in my cousin's house one night. Evicted by a ghost. Shortly after college, I got married and we immediately moved into a basement apartment because that's all that was available within our budget. And this place had a poltergeist and my wife was terrified. Whatever resided there with us made it clear it wanted to live alone. Dishes, 
glasses and other items would fly off the shelf. My wife was hit several times. There was always an ominous feeling like we were being watched. And at night, when we walked through the apartment in the dark, there would be insanely bright flashes of light that would illuminate the entire room. Fuck. One night, while we were going to bed, as soon as my wife and I walked into the bedroom, we heard a voice from nowhere say my name and move. My wife looked at me, I looked at her, and I said loudly, you've got it, bud. We moved out two days later and stayed with family. The old lady who owned the place died a few months later, and the house was torn down. It is still an empty lot to this day. Nothing but grass and a tree. I still drive by it every now and then. Dude! Okay, so, yeah. Nah. nah. That, so my story, if... Uh, I would actually rather tell it again here. So if you know it, sorry. If you don't, hey, don't bother watching the original video. It's pure crap. <laughs> so my cousin had a home in this shitty town called Longview, Washington. I call it shitty because I have fucking lived there and I can, all right? If you live there and you're not scum, hi, I wish I'd met you while I was there. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> so a lot of people had experiences in this house and I would come down to visit on the weekends and be like, what the fuck? When am I going to see something, right? When am I going to experience something? And I really wish I'd fucking not. <laughs> there was a night. So usually my cousin and I were the insomniacs of the family, right? And she'll go up to bed, but like, it's just reading time. That's when she reads. I'll read any time of the day and drive her nuts with that because she wants to hang, right? But nighttime is the right time. That is when she reads and just finishes wearing out her brain, right? So by the time I got up to bed, she still had her little nightstand lamp on and was reading her story, probably Stephen King, let's be real. And so I go into the room, I lay down, start the usual, like, oh great, this is gonna take five hours, right? And as I'm finally starting to relax, I'm sleeping on an old, probably from the 70s, California King waterbed. If you've never been on a waterbed, trust me when I say that you feel everything, every iota of anything, all right? And what I felt was like someone climbed onto the bed at the foot of the bed, came up behind me, and spooned me. Now at first, I thought it was a cat, a dog, whatever the fuck. So when I first felt something at the foot of the bed, it didn't phase me, right? So then I'm laying there and I feel it was like a man or someone larger than me, right? Tall or whatever, come up behind me and spoon up to me, jumped out of the freaking bed. It was like, no, not fucking playing that game or whatever the fuck I actually said along those lines, right? <sighs> no. Climb back into bed and try to chill the fuck back out, right? <sighs> well, now I got a story. <laughs> so, the door was closed, by the way. Just saying. So, I'm laying there. Now I gotta calm down again. Now I gotta, god damn it, I was just starting to relax. Round two, finally starting to relax. Suddenly I hear a voice like it filled the room. It was so fucking loud and it was a man's voice. Can't remember the exact words, but it was something along the lines of get out. I flew low fam, <sighs> right down those fucking steep ass stairs. Holy fucking shit. And I hung out in uh, the lazy boy watching the Discovery Channel or whatever until dawn when my cousin's husband woke up and then I climbed into bed with my cousin and that's when I finally slept. <laughs> a spoon turn. So yeah, that California King. <laughs> Sorry. 
We were driving my friend's really old beat up Subaru through a massive graveyard. We stopped and walked down a hill and came across a little pond. There was someone sitting on a rock on the other side of the pond and the figure was all black and we couldn't make out any features other than the fact it looked like a man who was wearing some old style top hat. We stupidly waved and shouted, hi. <laughs> he didn't show any acknowledgement and continued sitting still on the rock. All of a sudden, he jumped to his feet, started running to us on the water and then vanished in thin air about halfway on the pond. My friends and I screamed and ran back to the car. The car wouldn't start. Then we heard something banging on the back of the car. It wasn't a constant bang, but every few seconds or so we'd hear it. Nobody was outside from what we could see in the dark, but something was making a noise on the car. I opened my phone and started dialing my mom to give us a boost, but I had no service. None of us had any cell service. And the next 30 minutes, were spent trying to get her car started. No banging was heard afterwards, but we felt this heavy pressure around us. Finally, the car started and she hit the pedal to the metal. We sped out of the graveyard so fast, immediately crossing the gate, all of our phones regained cell service. One thing I know for certain is that someone or something was out there and it was not an animal or a human. This next story from Reddit is called The Death Witch. My dad used to work as a corrections officer at a rural prison. He drove the perimeter of the property for his entire shift, where he would check empty buildings for runaway inmates. He was generally a boring job. One night, my dad was parked on a hill reading a magazine when he started to feel a thumping in his body. He described it as the feeling you get when the speakers are playing a song with really heavy bass. <laughs> I mean, I don't like that. Who likes that? What the fuck? So he put the magazine down and checked his rearview mirror where he saw someone outside the truck, he grabbed his pistol, jumped out of the truck with his weapon drawn. Outside of the truck, he realized it was a procession of Native Americans walking through the truck and directly through his seat, only to disappear at the exact spot he was sitting. Holy fuck. He said it was clear they were ghosts because many of them appeared injured. Uh, this went on for a few seconds and then the whole procession disappeared. There are raccoons on my side. <laughs> you fucking assholes scared me. He called the other perimeter guy on his walkie to try to explain, and the other guy almost immediately stopped communicating. Turns out the other guy had seen this happen before, but didn't believe in ghosts, so he wouldn't talk about it. I was driving across country with my mom and sister when I was 16, and my sister was 20. It was late but we were well rested still and alert. We were driving along an interstate and needed gas and a bathroom break. So we stopped at the only rest stop in 200 miles. There was a van full of teenagers on a road trip at the gas station, as well as a small gray car parked at the pump in front of us with two young men standing still outside of it. When we got there, everything felt wrong. We'd been on the road for days and seen many rest stops at night and had never been afraid until then. My mom and sister went inside and I stayed in the car. I'd heard the teenagers say they were creeped out and couldn't get the pump to work and they left in a hurry. I was watching the car in front of us and the two men had not moved at all. Not an inch. They weren't talking. They weren't on phones. They were just standing there, still as stone. My sister and my mom came running back out to the car, and when they got in, the two men slowly turned to look at us while not moving or pivoting the rest of their bodies. I swear to fucking shit, 
we all saw the same thing. They had eyes dark as pitch and empty, truly empty, not black, not reflecting any light at all, just a void. We sped out of there and didn't stop until we were in the next city. The worst thing about the entire experience, we couldn't find the place on any map. We knew exactly which spot on the interstate to look, and we couldn't find it on Google Maps or any paper map we had. We even asked locals about the creepy gas station out on that stretch of road and we only got confused looks. We've traveled on the interstate since. There is no rest stop. I worked as a forensic nurse in a hospital's lockup unit. We had one older lady who swore she was being haunted and abused by a demon she would call Tiberius. So many crazy things happened while she was on the unit. We'd go into the room, do normal care, leave, and seconds later, she'd start screaming bloody murder. We'd run into the room to find her looking like she'd been in a fight with a boxing champ, bloody lip, black eye, markings all over her body. No one ever saw her doing this stuff to herself. Things would get moved around the room by themselves at one point, she was in protective restraints because the doctor thought she was hurting herself. There was no way she could have moved or done anything to herself while in these restraints, but new marks would always appear or her tray or cart would be across the room. The room was secure, so there was no way someone else was doing this. And when we asked her questions, she'd just say it was Tiberius. After she was discharged, we always had trouble with that room. There was going to be a rapid response or code to happen in that room. One night, a guard reported lights blinking off and on. It was that room. Let's go ahead and now say, so since we're trolling Reddit and it's some of these are going to be ghosties. Some of these are just going to be what the fuck. So there we go. So Cobwebs says, My grandma, born in 1905, once told me a story about when she was a kid, probably around 1912 or so. One of her great aunts died at home, and it was a rural community, so they didn't bother to get a doctor in. And in the tradition of the time, the body was laid out at the house to let relatives pay their respects. Now, normally you'd have to worry about the body beginning to decompose, but it was the middle of winter in Nebraska, so they just put her in an unheated back room, and she lay there for three days. When they finally went to bury her, the body was still warm. What? And they buried her anyway. At this point in the story, I said, um, Grandma? And she looked sort of embarrassed and said, well, apparently nobody liked her very much. With the lights on. Do you have your lights on? I do. Is that enough for both of us? It is, isn't it? I'm sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it down for this one. You know what? Fuck it, fam. Boosh. All right. This one is called Fran and Jock. I was the last in a long line of grandkids on both sides of the family. No one had ever said as much, but I'm pretty sure I was an oops baby. <laughs> God damn it, people. The result of one too many glasses of wine and a couple over 40 who thought unplanned pregnancies were for teens. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> so by the time I came along, both of my grandmothers had already passed away and my grandfathers were elderly and lived in different states. Trying to coordinate travel plans for a family of five, including an infant, was difficult on budget and neither of my grandpas were up to frequent trips, so visits were rare and spaced out over long periods. Still, both of my parents wanted me to have a relationship with them, so we'd trade phone calls so they could hear my nonsensical baby babble. 
They'd write me letters for mom and dad to read to me and they'd get crayon scribbles in return. That is freaking adorable. Oh my God. <laughs> oh. When I was three, they both started to experience declines in health. First, my maternal grandpa, then my paternal grandpa. Fearing the worst, mom purchased a pair of teddy bears, the kind that had recorders in them so you could record a message that would play when the bear was hugged. I made sure to get a message saved from both. I'm gonna, okay, I'm not gonna cry. I'm not gonna, my mother's father died when I was four. A few days after his funeral, I was given a white teddy bear with bright blue eyes that twinkled from beneath a placid flat cap and a green sweater. When I gave it a squeeze, I heard my grandpa's slightly muffled voice from its stomach. I love you, Sadie. Two years later, after dad's father passed, I got the other one. It was a slight gray color and the stitching on his face gave him a rather serious expression for a stuffed animal. A pair of a red suspenders held up his tan trousers. <laughs> that sounds so cute. I fell asleep hugging it and my dad told me some years later with tears in his eyes that randomly throughout that night, he kept hearing Grandpa's voice coming from my room. I love you, Sadie. I named my white bear Fran and my gray bear Chuck and put them on a shelf above my bed where they sat throughout my childhood. Honestly, I didn't give them much thought. They had become fixtures of my room, the way the lamp and dresser were. Every now and again, I'd come home from school and find one of my parents standing beside my bed looking up at the bears or giving them a little squeeze. Even as time passed, they still recited their single phrase without fail. Aside from those instances though, Fran and Jock were little more than dust collectors from my childhood. When I went away to college, the two didn't make the cut and were left behind while I made my way out into the world for the first time. I think my parents were a little disappointed that I wasn't more sentimental over the teddies, but any memories I had of my grandparents, my grandpas, were hazy at best, and I didn't have the same emotional connection that they did. And when mom gently asked about whether I would like them when I moved into my first apartment, I told her no, that they were probably better off with her. Okay, she said, well, they'll be here if you change your mind. I was pretty confident I wouldn't. <laughs> the next time I went back to my parents' place was to house sit while dad took mom on their long awaited vacation out west. He'd been promising her they'd go for over 30 years and they were both buzzing with excitement. In typical mom fashion, however, she was also very nervous. You remember where all the financial documents are in case anything happens to us, right? She asked from the back seat at least six times on the drive to the airport. Yes, in the white bin under your bed and the wills, fireproof lockbox in the back of your closet. And the, I think she's got it, hun, dad said, reaching back to give her knee a squeeze. Mom <laughs> and said, just call if you need anything. I'll be fine, don't worry. You're only going for a week. A lot can happen in a week, she said. I mean, mom was not wrong. You weren't wrong, ma. I grinned at her in the rearview mirror, unconcerned. Oh, mother. And she made a face at me that seemed to relax. After I dropped them off, I drove back to their place and started to make myself at home again. I tossed my suitcase on the bed and went to the kitchen to make some dinner and catch up on one of my shows. It had been a while since I'd had a true, completely free week all to myself, and I planned to take full advantage of it. After I ate, I kicked up my feet, stretched out, and commenced lazy lump mode. We like to call that slouching around here. I managed to get almost three episodes in <laughs> before I started to nod off. You're about my age, aren't you? I checked the clock over the TV inside. It's only just after 11, was I really? Listen, listen, don't you say old. Don't you say old. Early to bed woman already, the horror. Fuck you. 
I rolled off the couch and shut off the TV and all the lights, plunging the house into deep darkness. And then I reached out for the furry collar. Um, what? Even in the inky black, I didn't even feel a twinge of nervousness. I'd grown up in the house. I knew it like the back of my hand. And all of his creaks and groans were almost comforting. I made my way to my room and flipped off the light. It had been at least five years since I lived there, but my parents hadn't done much to change my room, except store a few bits and bobs in the closet. They said it was so I'd know I'd always have a place with them. I thought it was because changing it would make the fact that I was out for good more real. I mean, that might also be true, whatever. Whatever the reason, I appreciated the familiarity. As I started to unpack my bag, my eye was drawn to the shelf over my bed. Fran and Jock, ever vigilant, were sitting in the same spots they'd occupied for most of my life. I don't know why, but I couldn't help but smile and reach out to them. I took Fran down first and gave his little cap a tweak before squeezing his round stomach. I love you, Sadie, Grandpa said. After putting Fran back, I did the same to Jock who stared up at me with his usual sternness, even as I plucked one red suspender. I love you, Sadie, Grandpa said. It was the first time I'd listened to them in a while. Even if they didn't resonate as deeply with me as they did my parents, I was glad to find their recording still worked. A quick trip to the bathroom and a change into my PJs later, I was in bed and fast falling asleep. I can't say exactly what woke me. A nightmare, I figured, given that my heart was beating quite quickly, but I couldn't remember any details. I took a deep breath, rolled over, already falling half asleep again, and found myself face to face with a dark figure on the pillow beside me. I yelped and sat up, grabbing at my phone, my near source of light, and shined it toward my bed. Fran was lying on his side beside me. I let out a small chuckle and gave myself a little shake to dismiss the lingering fright that he'd caused. Picked him up. Did you fall off the shelf? I asked him quietly. I must have put him back too close to the edge earlier and gravity had done its duty. I gave Fran a gentle squeeze. Get out. I stared down at the bear and blinked once very slowly. Must be more sleepy than I realized, I thought. I was hearing things. To prove to myself that it had just been my imagination, I squeezed him again. Get out. It was still Grandpa's voice, but instead of the soft warmth it had always had, it sounded cold, almost menacing. I threw Fran across the room where he hit the wall, and from over my head I heard Grandpop's more gravelly voice, get out. I whipped round and looked at Jock. He was sitting in the same place as always, but now he was turned towards the door instead of facing forward. Had I put him down like that? I couldn't remember. Get out. Grandpa's voice came from Fran louder this time. Get out, Grandpa echoed from Jock. The two went back and forth, their voices getting louder and louder until I slapped my hands over my ears and leapt from my bed. I wanted to scream, but my voice was stuck behind my fear tangled tongue, stumbled across my dark room, chased by my long dead grandfather's voices. I know you're down there, Jock shouted with Grandpop's voice. I froze. Down there? Down under the shelf? I glanced over my shoulder at the gray bear staring silently down from over my bed. I had to get out of my room. I had to get out of the house. I yanked open my door. I see you. Fran said in Grandpa's voice. I was halfway out the hall, tears streaming down my face. I didn't know what was happening. Was I going crazy? Was I dreaming? All I knew was that my two childhood toys were screaming threats at me, and I had to get away from them. I turned toward the stairs, 
You take one more step, I'll make sure it's your last, Jock bellowed. Get out, Fran roared. From somewhere downstairs, a step creaked. Someone else was inside the house. They weren't yelling at me at all, I realized, with a very strange mix of confusing relief and newly formed horror. They were yelling at the intruder who was making their way up the stairs toward me. Get out, my grandfather's howled together. Footsteps clamored across the wood floor downstairs. Something fell over in the living room with a loud crash and again in the kitchen before the back door slammed across the counter as it was thrown open and a car engine rumbled to life. Somehow, I regan regained my wits enough to run to my parents' room and look out the window to the driveway below. An SUV was peeling backwards out into the streets, slammed into the neighbor's mailbox, righted itself, and then screeched off into the night. A heavy quiet had fallen over the house again. After waiting a few long, tense minutes, I crept back across the hall and peeked into my room. Fran and Jock were where I'd left them, both completely silent. When they stayed that way, <laughs> I hesitantly approached Fran, who was lying on his side with his little cat beside him. I picked him up and, with trembling fingers, squeezed his stomach. I love you, Sadie, Grandpa said warmly. I put his cat back on his head and gently put him back on the shelf beside Jock and backed out of the room, watching them the whole time with wide eyes. As I rounded the corner, heading downstairs to the phone, I heard Grandpop's voice trailing after me. I love you, Sadie. The police arrived a bit later following my frantic call to 911. I filed a report, leaving out the bit about my talking bears and allowed them to collect whatever evidence they could. Every so often, I found myself glancing at the stairs almost like I was expecting a repeat of whatever had just happened. It never came, and the cops wrapped it up, leaving me alone again. When I called to my parents to tell them about the break-in, they immediately wanted to rush home, but I assured them there was no need. Really, I said, I don't think I have anything to worry about. We could be on the next plane, Mom insisted. No, I'm okay. Whatever that guy was, I'm pretty sure he won't be back. It took a few more go-arounds, but I eventually convinced them I was safe. And I felt it too, for the most part. After the initial shock had worn off and I had time to process what had happened, I really was okay. Couldn't explain it. I couldn't tell anyone what had happened without sounding crazy, but I knew it had been real. And I knew as long as I had Fran and Jock sitting on the shelf above my bed, I could sleep easy. A few days later, the cops did find the guy who broke in. He was a co-worker of my dad's who'd overheard he'd be out of town. He thought the house would be empty and easy pickings. And when he tried to tell them about the two crazy guys upstairs and their violent threats, they rolled their eyes and laughed at him. He was very surprised to hear that only a 20-year-old woman had been in the house during his botched burglary. When I returned home to my apartment a week later, Fran and Jock were with me. I keep them on the TV stand in the living room now, where they have full view of the front door. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. Whenever I start to feel a bit anxious about being alone, I give each bear a little squeeze and smile as they speak. I love you, Sadie. And now I respond, I love you both too. Oh, that was a feel-good story. Thank you so much for hanging out with me as we go over these stories. Which ones do you think are real? Do you think any of them are true? Or do you think they're all full of shit and just having fun online? I don't know. Let me know down below in the comments what you think. And until next time and beyond, please take care. Now I'll try as well. <laughs>